Hey, Geekscapists, I've got a treat for you right now. Uh, playwright and filmmaker Neil Abute is here. He's got a brand new film, House of Darkness. It's available in theaters September 9th in On Demand and digital uh, September 13th. And I watched the movie. If you're a horror fan, you're going to love it. If you're really a, a fan of Neil's, I think you're going to love it because it's got all the it's got all the pieces that are like your signatures. Wouldn't you say that this is a horror movie, but through your lens? I think so. Yeah, I think it's probably a great way to describe it. Yeah, it's, it starts out feeling like one thing and then morphs into to something else along the way. And, and hopefully that's a fun ride. Yeah, what I loved about it, and I remember back in the 90s uh, in The Company of Men, yeah. and the way you discovered Aaron Eckhart, who I, I guess you went to, to college with. That's right. Um, that, that movie was, sometimes you can describe your movies as cruel, but I think... I don't know if you can judge them. Does that make sense? Like, uh, I think as a storyteller, you try not to judge your character. Yeah, I mean, that's, it makes sense to me. I don't yeah. know that it always makes sense to an audience. Sometimes they feel like, you know, they're too distanced or, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's this kind of, you know, cool or cruel veneer to some of the things and, and they don't want to be a part of that. But, um, you know, you hope that you create an experience that, uh, that that feels like it's it's authentically your own and that people will embrace it because it's it's different but um but not everybody does i've I had very split reactions to most things and probably will to this is that what you're going to for though and in, in i mean is it a search for some level of catharsis with you where you you say okay like if you're living in a society of uh let's just say it's um personal repression or uh the especially in a movie like this uh be not being allowed to be who you are or or thinking that you have to align yourself with a lie in order to protect others or protect yourself and it is still a lie that sort of moral uh morality play that you're that you're always working with um where does that come from what level of again catharsis are you looking for whenever you put the pen to the Well, paper. I think those questions are interesting as, you know, for people, just whether it's in your entertainment or just in your conversation across the dinner table. So I hope that I'm picking up on things that are, you know, not even necessarily in the zeitgeist, but just are big common questions that we ask of ourselves and each other. And then you filter that into the work that you're, you're doing as an entertainment that you can, it's okay to entertain and instruct or, or, you know, bring up something that's interesting to you as a person and uh, not even have a, you know, an instructive quality to it. It's not, not that. It's so much as, as, hey, I've been thinking about this a lot and, and I'm going to have characters think about it as well. And are they based on anybody sometimes? Where does some of these stories originate? Rare, rarely my stuff, you know, uh, can I say 100% No. Uh, but I can I can very easily say mostly no. Most of these things are just from the imagination. You know, just me coming up with with stories. That's the job. I'm trying to be a storyteller, and so you you come up each day looking for something new to tell or or a way into a story. You know, it's not like we haven't seen a man and a woman you know drive to his or her place, and and what happens next is this. Uh, there's been a lot of those stories. So to tell another one today, you, you have to have a legitimately, hopefully different take on that than what you've seen before. Well, what I love about your movies is that if you had that road trip movie, and let's just call this a road trip movie, it's a bit of a bottle movie. Uh, it feels like you're, you know, you're going back to your playwright roots with this thing. It is very much a, a, a play uh, in limited acts and Geekscape is, I loved it. I'm not even the biggest horror fan as you, you listeners know. Uh, but I loved this movie because, again, it's through Neil's lens. And if you have that road trip movie, um, usually a road trip movie is a, a fairly easy script to do because the uh, hurdles for the characters are external things that they encounter on the road. W with your movies, though, those hurdles are always the other person they're riding with and the things inside that are being dredged up. Um, and that's what I thought was fascinating here is ultimately this is digging to the truth of who these characters are. Right. And what kind of, I mean, your writing process, do these things start out as externalizations that you internalize or do you like inhabiting within the internalization 
and dredging this stuff into externalizations? It's it's a little of both. You know, I, I start out with the, the, the idea comes in whatever way. I usually don't spend time um, bullet pointing like scene by scene or I know exactly how long every every moment is going to be. I may very well see the the goalpost. You know, I may have said, I know how, where, how this is going to end. Mm -hmm. And so I'll find my way there as a writer by searching, you know, I'll, I may write myself into a corner and have to back out and, you know, go down the hallway a different way. Um, that certainly has happened many times to me, but uh, I think that process when it's been most effective has been the similar experience for an audience that it's, it feels like a mystery trying to get there. They don't usually get ahead of the story. They, they have to figure their and feel their way there as well as they watch. So that's the, the best experience that I think I can offer is one that feels like a, a, a unique version of whatever it is that they're, they're seeing. Oh, this is a, a marriage piece. This is a piece, you know, about, about two people who just met cute or whatever. You know, you're, you're going to see a legitimately different take on it. Um, and as you write, different things creep in. I tend to not start with theme like, oh, this is going to be about this. It's, it's a little more matter of fact about I'm taking these two people, I'm putting them in a room and I'm going to see what happens. And theme kind of comes out of that. And that's part of your exploratory process. I think so. Say, yeah. yeah. There's a meet cute in this movie. Geekscape is very much starts with the meet cute. And I really enjoyed listening to the words just kind of come out. And, uh, and I felt like it, it did have that exploratory sense for me is Again, uh, the movie's fairly minimal on set pieces, and it is two people talking, and they're in a meet cute, and they're uh, Hap is dropping Mina off. They don't even know each other's names, and it's always good to see Justin Long and uh, Kate Bosworth again, and yeah. they're kind of feeling this thing out, and they have secrets as they do in uh, in most of your films. These people have secrets, and it's just uh, where are they going to? slip on those secrets where the tells come out how do you pick up on the tells and i also love that you in your films you're not rushing to do the camera tricks you're not you're just kind of documenting these things almost like those stage plays that you put together and it's up to the audience to kind of watch this and say hey i picked up on it did they pick up on it or oh i missed it but somebody something just shifted there there's an energy that shifted and Neil is, oh, there's a push going in, or there's a little bit of a slight move. Neil wants us to pay attention. And that's kind of what I love about the energy in this movie. Yeah. Um, how much of that stuff was, uh, I mean, how much of this script is set in stone when Justin and Kate show up? And stone how much is it ever found? Yeah, li li liquid cement, maybe, you know, <laughs> but, it's, but it's, it's always pliable. It's, um, uh, you, you try and lay a, a really good blueprint down. And one that feels very sturdy to you. And I, as a director, I try and go in with a way to do things. You know, I think about every scene and go, um, okay, I mean, like this thing, as you say, you know, it's it's um, a, a very limited number of locations in terms of this one big castle, you know, home in the woods. Um, but you still have to figure out how long are we going to spend in the library? How long are we going to go outside? How long are we going to come back in and go into the living room? Um and, and why and what makes sense there. Because, you know, someone can come visit you at your home. You can happily sit on the couch the whole evening and talk. You know, you might get up, go to the bathroom, go to get water. But it's not to, to make the picture more interesting. But often we feel like in movies or on stage, we've got to keep people moving around or it won't be interesting. I'm very interested in what people say. And, and just those, as you say, those little minutiae of a shift in, in the or the silence in, in what isn't said. You know, why did I not say something there? Because you caught me off guard. And so capturing those with these actors, um, what happens is you have these actors who come in and breathe life into these characters. And and um, something that I've, I've done a lot of my career is cast people who I think have a, a currency with the audience that goes beyond them as actors, often just as people. Like you take someone like Justin and people, you know, if someone... Uh, sees a picture of Justin, they're like, oh, I like that guy. 
they might not even be able to say what his name is. They're like, oh, he's funny. Yeah, he's funny. He's, he sold me a phone back in the two exactly. thousands. I remember that guy. Exactly. That's you know that's they feel like they, they know him. You know what I mean? And yeah. oh yeah, he's really funny. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot of goodwill going into it. So I think he's getting away with a lot of stuff in the movie, even that another actor might not. You might immediately go, just call a bluff on that. Like this guy's kind of an asshole. This guy is, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? He's he's just trying to get in her pants. Whatever it is that they go with someone like Justin, and they're like, they think, oh, he's he's a nice guy, you know. And and this guy is self-professed a nice guy you know, in the movie, but you watch him grow from this guy who drops her off and like, oh, I wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking about coming in to you hear behind the scenes what he's really thinking. And then, you know, all that time he's in a position of presumed power. Like he's, he's in a place where he feels like he's controlling the events of the evening and anything that puts him off that game is interesting to watch how it registers on him right down toward the very end of the film where he still kind of feels like I'm going to go home now. I've had enough of your crap. I'm, you know, and, and you see what happens after those, those moments happen. Um, but it's fun to watch how that character's uh, security disintegrates throughout the process and how still Kate can be and just, you know, just stare at you with these eyes and you're looking at this very pretty face and someone who's been, you know, often like the love interest in stuff. And, you know, and yet you're looking at her going, there's something, I don't, I don't know if I, I trust this person, you know, but he doesn't see it. All he sees is this pretty face and and what looks like it's going to be a great evening. If anything, those silences, I think, are what works. Like I said, with the camera movements, like the, just letting us as an audience get drawn in the same way the characters are getting the same way that Justin really is getting drawn yeah. into this. Yeah. The audience is, hopefully is happening at the same time. With, with we need the to fill the gaps and you're giving us the room. I mean, I think a, a, a more insecure filmmaker would have tried to fill those gaps either with camera movement, with dialogue, with, with more cuts, this and that, but you're just, yeah. where did, did you always have that confidence? Is that something that if I go back and watch in the company of men, which I haven't seen honestly, since it came out, very, very I, long takes with very, you not much cover. Does, does that come from theater where you're just like, hey, we go live and that's what it, where it lands? Part of, and if part of it and part of it is just liking films that are shot that way. You know, I've always been a fan of that kind of like long takes where you're watching both actors in the frame. Um, but here also, you know, I want I, I would want to mention you know the the team you're working with, especially Daniel Katz who shot the film. He had to have the same confidence. You know what I mean? He he also, he did a few creeps that I probably didn't even know about, you know, where like <laughs> the camera just slightly shifts in on somebody, you know, and, and, and you can you can only just kind of emotionally feel it. You don't even almost notice yeah. it. You, you know? know it's right, but I, but I like he, watching the frames. If you watch yeah, the frames, you is, can slowly be like, oh, it moves Exactly, it's changing a little bit, but you didn't notice it. Um, he is He was really, uh, you know, gifted and, and not only lit it, beautifully but also you know uh shot shot at himself and um and uh, and kept a very steady hand on uh and also wanted to go for the ride of like i don't want to shoot a bunch of coverage and we don't have time for it you know we're shooting this very quickly so uh let's let the actors do the work and um and and enjoy the ride no what i like about it is that you don't draw from the horror well of energy equating to audio jump scares and quick cuts uh and kind of those slaps in the face of the audience to say hey yeah. you're supposed to jump here because i just slapped you audibly yeah, or i played the music so loud you you should have jumped yeah like... the, the it's more of a tone it's more of a creeping just you you, you want to by the end of this you want to get out of that house as much as hap does yeah uh, justin's character and one question is like Clearly on this one, in Geekscape is you got to watch this movie. It's out on September 9th on, uh, in theaters and on demand in uh, September 13th. Um, this felt like you designed it from the last sequence backwards. And some of your movies with the role reveals and the way it's like, hey, but at the end there's going to be this Hitchcock-like twist internally with the characters where there's irony, where there's tragedy, where there's a bit of maybe satisfaction to some pe people. Um, and you feel like sometimes the magic trick has been designed backwards. And I don't mean to just like 
water your stuff down to magic tricks. It's not. There's a lot of thought and design that goes into it. Have you ever started to say, okay, if that's the ending, let me work my way back towards the early or the mid, uh, the beginning. And as you start to explore these characters in drafts, as you start to familiarize yourself with them and they become strangers, then friends, then family members in subsequent drafts, have they ever surprised you and refused to meet that ending that you had predestined for them? Sure, sure. That is, it's, it's, that's very well put. I haven't heard it put that way before. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so, and sometimes you you get out the tools and go, oh, you don't think you're going to go there. I, <laughs> you I'm going to force you, you in this situation. hammer that I've got here because I'm about to knock you senseless until I get you to fit into that hole. Is that always good to do, or does it fight the no, organic nature of not, your process? Not, yeah. But I'm saying that I have found myself doing that, going, hey, I wrote those 90 pages. Now we're <laughs> we're going where I want to go at the end of this. Is um, studio intervention, maybe? We can put yeah. it on and say, I mean, listen, listen, you're going to have this set any piece. Divine intervention is anybody else reading it and going, no, why Why do you keep doing that? You could, mm. you could just do this. Or, but the characters yeah, have to exist. Listen, they have listen, to, to what, the truth. listen to what the characters are telling you. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have to try and do that. Honestly, listen to, you know, and, and also sometimes, you know, not go for the easy out or, or, oh, this, an audience would like this thinking that's the best way. You know, I, I've, I think I've, I've helped myself along the way many times by saying, this is where the characters wanted to go. Whether you like it or not, this is what the ending is supposed to be. It's not me saying I want it to be this or, or this is what I know an audience would like more. This ending is abrupt and sad, but that's how it's supposed to end, you know, right now anyway. Uh, I've certainly done that on stage and, and screen. But um, more so is probably the other direction where I've been writing, you know, I'm writing something and I, I get to like, you know, page 50 and I'm like, my hands are starting to ring a little bit going, man, something should be happening right now. You know, <laughs> these people have talked for a long time and, and I like the talk, but somebody's got to get up from the table here at some point. Someone's got to do something. Um, and I feel like I've, oh, I've, I've written my, my premise into the corner and it, you know, and, and it doesn't actually work as a, as a, a whole. So um, that can, I guess, happen from either end, but, but um, I'm good about going back and rewriting. That's one good thing about me is I, I've, I've, I've taught, you know, in the past and I've, I've met a lot of people, whether they're students or just writers at, at various things. And, 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 inevitably you find some question and a number of people at those things who are like, Oh, how do you, what do you do about rewriting? You know, as if it's like just this labor where I'm like, I just do it. I mean, so it's, it's writing. I mean, you call it rewriting, but it's, it's part of the process. I, I, I love it as much as, as the writing process. So I've never found it to be a struggle. I'm like, Oh my God, I can't go back to those characters. I'm like, I do it all the time. And so it's hard, harder for me to understand what you hate about it so much. But what I will tell you is you got to do it, you know, in the same way that you have to actually sit down and write in the first place to ever have anything to read. So um, there's no, there's no, yeah, people are often looking for keys, you know, tricks. Like how do you, how do I, how do I do it? How do I unlock the mystery the, box? It's, they're just shortcuts. Yeah. And it's what's not, the, what's the doing? trick to get them? Like the trick is there's no trick. You know, um, and, and that's the good news and the bad news. It's just you've got to keep tapping your fingers until you have a stack of stuff. And if that stuff isn't, you know, gold yet, you you run it back through the processor until, you know, you've got something. Um, and there, there's there's no real shortcut to that. You know, and I hate to tell you, this gave us, it's got to be a page one. Like it has to, because it, it's not a process of rewriting. If you think, if you shift your focus to a process of, of educating yourself and delving deeper in, in it's paleontology more than anything. Hmm. And you have to just go back to the softer tools and just be like, okay, well I got that far. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Geekscape is, I don't have to tell you, you like video games. You don't beat the video game on the first time you play it. If you lose, you got to go back to the beginning of the video God game bless, and start it over again. Mean, God bless them if they do. But yeah, and, I, and I, you know, I, I met writers who are, are so precious about their stuff and they, they don't want to change anything. And I'm like, God bless that you, you know, this magic shit comes out of you that is perfect the first time. How did you do that? I would love to know because it's never happened to me. And I've done this so many times and yet I, it's never been perfect. And it's never perfect even on the set when, you know, it's so funny that somebody has, you know, they're like, 
oh, hey, what about this is the final line? And you're like, great idea. Or you get to th all the way to the editing process. You've, you've written the thing. You've rewritten it. You've cast it. You've shot it. And then you get there and an editor goes, do we need this scene? Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, that was the problem. We don't need this scene. I yeah. saved half a day of shooting, but I didn't see it, you know? So it's a good thing. What you should really do is have a lot of people read things and not be afraid of someone not loving what you've done. But, you know, a, a good idea is way better than a, a, a warm hug when it comes to writing sometimes. You know, you really need someone who's honest enough to tell you what they really think. And when you get to the end of one of these films... Yeah. which ones are in looking back at the ones that educated you and propelled you forward and said, wow, I learned a lesson there. Now, because oh. these all feel like a sense of education for you. Yeah, like I, I feel I like mean, every time, right. This is all some, this is you digging your stuff and we're watching and we're enjoying it. Neil, don't get self-conscious. We're watching you <laughs> dig through uh, your stuff and trying well, to see some, how pieces. Some bounce. more than others. Um, yeah. But um, it's, you, you learn something every time, but, but often, you know, as much with the ones where, you feel like you've got it right. Um, it, it, the ones that you've got it, what ultimately you, you, you listen to people and you think, wow, people didn't like that as much. Um, you learn as much from that or if not more that, you know, what, what went wrong or, or what, you know, didn't click with people. Um, you know, the, the, the play, the stage play that I think, you know, is the, like I would consider the one that got away is probably the one that I rewrote the most. But, you know, there was something in there that I still just legitimately feel like I didn't quite land. Didn't um, crack it. But not for want of trying. You know, mm -hmm. I've got more drafts of that and scenes from that than anything else on my computer. But I still don't feel like I unlocked the 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 the, the perfect center of it. Is so, that on its feet? Did you make? It? Oh yeah, and it's been. What, it's been, what was I've it called? It. it was called The Break of Noon. Yeah. Um, and I love the premise. I love the script. Uh, the productions that I've I've seen, I, I, I was you know happy with the actors, and all, but there was something in there I felt like I didn't quite land something in there that, that, that made the journey exactly right. But did, I go back and tinker on stuff all the time. Did Neil live enough life by that point, or not enough life? I mean, when you think about your uh, approach, there was, to there, was like there was plenty of life. Yeah, <laughs> it know, just so, there was plenty sometimes of the... there, there were plenty of skills. <laughs> I just sometimes they, they you know they get away from you. The fish breaks the line and swims away. And when you look at something like The Wicker Man, that like I haven't seen The Wicker Man Geeks Gabe, it's because y'all just threw a bunch of memes on the internet and it just turned into like you know what I mean? And so when you have something like a like a remake and there so there are some form of parameters going in, how does that exploratory process play out for you with something like a remake? Well, it's you know, you 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 ultimately find out, oh my god, people you know, love this movie in a way that, that you didn't realize or uh, you went in thinking we can make this out of that. But in the that in that particular case, it felt like we probably had too many cooks in the kitchen uh, trying, to, trying to make something and, and ultimately didn't decide exactly on what we wanted to make. Um, but I had a great time doing it. Nick was a blast to work with. Um, but uh, But that was one that felt like, oh, yeah, maybe that got away from us. But um, again, not not for want of trying. You know, you 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 work as hard on the ones that 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 aren't successful as the ones that are. And um, what what makes one click with an audience and one not? It's if I knew that, I would probably be teaching more than I do. Right. And when you look at the last couple of movies, and obviously there's a reality in theatrical and post COVID and during COVID, even before COVID, it felt like. If you weren't a Marvel movie, you were going to make a smaller and smaller film. Does it feel like these films are more honest to Neil Abu than were something like Wicker Man that because of the production value of it, the size of it, it did have inherently more cooks? Maybe uh, are these more Neil Abu films that you're making now? I, I think so. I mean, there's certainly more of a size like what I started out with. And I think, you know, the the more control for, 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 for good or bad, you know, whether you, you like it or not. Regardless of that, you you feel like you have created what you set out to create. You know, the more control you have over that product. So those films that cost twenty five thousand dollars the first time you made one, but you know, a, a million dollar movie. You know that that has very few producers 
and and unless you you know make it the way you want to make it, like House of Darkness, you you feel like that is what you set out to do, and 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 it looks a whole lot like what you had in your head from the very beginning. Well, Geekscapist, I'm just going to tell you one last time. I loved this movie. I thought it was great. And again, I'm not a horror person, but I am a Neil Butte fan. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the um, show, Neil. I am a fan. Uh, and I loved the way that you put all the pieces in place in this little game that was being played in these characters. Uh, the movie is out in theater September 9th, on demand and digital September 13th. Neil, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. And Pleasure. thank you. We'll watch the next one. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Take care. <laughs>